In the 1840s, the Victorian journalist Henry Mayhew observed and documented the state of working people in London for a series of articles in a newspaper, The Morning Chronicle, that were later compiled into the book London Labour and the London Poor. Mayhew went into great detail about the lives of people living in the city and, importantly, for understanding the brutal reality of what life was really like for the many and not the few in 19th century London. He took the trouble to interview workers so that we have a genuine first-hand account of life. Mayhew interviewed everyone. Beggars, street entertainers, market traders, harlots, labourers, sweatshop workers, even down to the mudlarks who searched the stinking mud on the banks of the River Thames for scrap from passing ships. He described their clothes, how and where they lived, their entertainments and customs. His account highlights how marginal and precarious many people's lives were in what, at that time, was perhaps the richest city in the world. Mayhew's work describes many lesser-known and now obsolete trades driven by sheer poverty. Among the street finders, there was perhaps the greatest hardship. They being the very lowest class of all the street people, they went out daily to find in the streets and carry away with them such things as bones, rags, pure or dog's dung, which no one appropriates. Check out my video on the Bone Grubbers to learn more about that horrible job. Link in the description and end screen. The poor sold what they found and on that sale supported a wretched life. In particular, the subject of this video is the Pure Finder. This occupation was as dreadful in reality as it sounds, involving an extreme form of recycling. You will learn in detail about the desperate conditions of those who found themselves trapped in this form of work in order to earn money to feed themselves. Before we start, please consider clicking the subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. These two things really do show your support and help the channel grow so I can bring you more. Thank you. Check out the description for links to more interesting videos about the Victorians and take a look at the channel page for even more content. Dog's dung is called pure from its cleansing and purifying properties. The name of Pure Finders however, has been applied to the men engaged in collecting dog's dung from the public streets only within the last 20 or 30 years. Previous to this period, there appears to have been no men engaged in the business. Old women alone gathered the substance, and they were known by the name of bunters, which signifies properly gatherers of rags, and thus plainly intimates that the rag gatherers originally added the collecting of pure to their original and proper vocation. Hence it appears that the bone grubbers, rag gatherers and pure finders constituted formerly but one class of people, and even now they have, as I have stated, kindred characteristics. The pure finders meet with a ready market for all the dog's dung they are able to collect at the numerous tanyards in Bermondsey, where they sell it by the stable bucketful and get from eight pence to ten pence per bucket, and sometimes one shilling and one shilling two pence for it, according to its quality. The dry, limey-looking sort fetches the highest price at some yards, as it is found to possess more of the alkaline or purifying properties, but others are found to prefer the dark, moist quality. Strange as it may appear, the preference for a particular kind has suggested to the finders of pure the idea of adulterating it to a very considerable extent. This is effected by means of mortar broken away from old walls and mixed up with the whole mass, which it closely resembles. In some cases, 
However, the mortar is rolled into small balls similar to those found. Hence, it would appear that there is no business or trade, however insignificant or contemptible, without its own peculiar and appropriate tricks. The pure finders are in their habits and mode of proceeding nearly similar to the bone grubbers. Many of the pure finders are, however, better in circumstances, the men especially, as they earn more money. They are also, to a certain extent, a better educated class. Some of the regular collectors of this substance have been mechanics and others small tradesmen who have been reduced. Those pure finders who have a good connection and have been granted permission to cleanse some kennels obtain a very fair living at the business, earning from 10 shillings to 15 shillings a week. These, however, are very few. The majority have to seek the article in the streets, and by such means they can obtain only from 6 shillings to 10 shillings a week. The average weekly earnings of this class are thought to be about 7 shillings 6 pence. From all the inquiries I have made on this subject, I have found that there cannot be less than from 200 to 300 persons constantly engaged solely in this business. There are about 30 tanyards large and small in Bermondsey, and these all have their regular pure collectors from whom they obtain the article. Leomont and Robertses, Bavingtons, Beeches, Morels, Cheesemans, Powells, Joneses, Jordans, Kents, Moorcrofts, and Davises are among the largest establishments, and some idea of the amount of business done in some of these yards may be formed from the fact that the proprietors severally employ from 300 to 500 tanners. At Leomont and Robertses, there are 23 regular street finders who supply them with pure, but this is a large establishment and the number of supplying them is considered far beyond the average quantity. Moreover, Messrs. Leomont and Roberts do more business in the particular branch of tanning in which the article is principally used, namely in dressing the leather for book covers, kid gloves, and a variety of other articles. Some of the other tan yards, especially the smaller ones, take the substance only as they happen to want it, and others again employ but a limited number of hands. If, therefore, we strike an average and reduce the number supplying each of the several yards to eight, we shall have 240 persons regularly engaged in the business. Besides these, it may be said that numbers of the starving and destitute Irish have taken to picking up the material, but not knowing where to sell it or how to dispose of it, they part with it for two pence or three pence, the pailful, to the regular purveyors of it to the tanyards, who, of course, make a considerable profit by the transaction. The children of the poor Irish are usually employed in this manner, but they also pick up rags and bones and anything else which may fall in their way. I have stated that some of the pure finders, especially the men, earn a considerable sum of money per week. Their gains are sometimes as much as 15 shillings, Indeed, I am assured that seven years ago, when they got from three shillings to four shillings per pail for the pure, that many of them would not exchange their position with that of the best-paid mechanic in London. Now, however, the case is altered, for there are twenty now at the business for everyone who followed it then. Hence, each collects so much the less in quantity, and, moreover, from the competition gets so much less for the article. Some of the collectors at present do not earn three shillings per week, but these are mostly old women who are feeble and unable to get over the ground quickly. Others make five shillings and six shillings in the course of the week, while the most active and those who clean out the kennels of the dog fanciers may occasionally make nine shillings and ten shillings and even fifteen shillings a week still. But this is a very rare occurrence allowing the finders, one with the other, to earn on an average five shillings per week, it would give the annual earnings of each to be 13 pounds, while the income of the whole 200 would amount to 50 pounds a week, or 2,600 pounds per annum. The kennel 
pure is not much valued. Indeed, many of the tanners will not even buy it. The reason is that the dogs of the fanciers are fed on almost anything to save expense. The kennel cleaners consequently take the precaution of mixing it with what is found in the street previous to offering it for sale. The pure finder may at once be distinguished from the bone grubber and rag gatherer. The latter, as I have before mentioned, carries a bag and usually a stick armed with a spike, while he is most frequently to be met in back streets, narrow lanes, yards, and other places where dust and rubbish are likely to be thrown out from the adjacent houses. The pure finder, on the contrary, is often found in the open streets as dogs wander where they like. The pure finders always carry a handle basket, generally with a cover to hide the contents, and have their right hand covered with a black leather glove. Many of them, however, dispense with a glove, as they say it is much easier to wash their hands than to keep the glove fit for use. The women generally have a large pocket for the reception of such rags, as they may chance to fall in with, but they pick up those only of the very best quality and will not go out of their way to search even for them. Thus equipped, they may be seen pursuing their avocation in almost every street in and about London, excepting such streets as are now cleansed by the street orderlies, of whom the pure finders grievously complain as being an unwarrantable interference with the privileges of their class. The pure collected is used by leather dressers and tanners, and more especially by those engaged in the manufacture of Morocco and kid leather from the skins of old and young goats, of which skins great numbers are imported, and of the roans and lamb skins, which are the sham Morocco and kids of the slop leather trade, and are used by the better class of shoemakers, bookbinders, and glovers for the inferior requirements of their business. Pure is also used by tanners, as is pigeon's dung, for the tanning of the thinner kinds of leather, such as calf skins, for which purpose it is placed in pits with an admixture of lime and bark. In the manufacture of Moroccos and Rowans, the pure is rubbed by the hands of the workman into the skin he is dressing. This is done to purify the leather. I was told by an intelligent leather dresser, and from that term the word pure has originated. The dung has a stringent as well as highly alkaline, or, to use the expression of my informant, scouring qualities. When the pure has been rubbed into the flesh and grain of the skin, the flesh being originally the interior and the grain the exterior part of the cuticle, and the skin thus purified has been hung up to be dried, the dung removes, as it were, all such moisture as, if allowed to remain, would tend to make the leather unsound or imperfectly dressed. This imperfect dressing, moreover, gives a disagreeable smell to the leather, and leather buyers often use both nose and tongue in making their purchases, and would consequently prevent that agreeable odor being imparted to the skin which is found in some kinds of Morocco and kid. The peculiar odor of the Russia leather, so agreeable in the libraries of the rich, is derived from the bark of young birch trees. It is now manufactured in Bermondsey. Among the Morocco manufacturers, especially among the old operatives, there is often a scarcity of employment, and they then dress a few roans, which they hawk to the cheap warehouses, or sell to the wholesale shoemakers on their own account. These men usually reside in small garrets in the poorer parts of Bermondsey, and carry on their trade in their own rooms, using and keeping the pure there. Hence, the homes of these poor men are peculiarly uncomfortable, if not unhealthy. Some of these poor fellows, or their wives, collect the pure themselves, often starting at daylight for the purpose. They more frequently, however, buy it of a regular finder. The number of pure finders I heard estimated by a man well acquainted with the tanning and other departments of the leather trade at from 200 to 250, 
The finders, I was informed by the same person, collected about a pailful a day, clearing six shillings a week in the summer, one shilling and one shilling two pence being the charge for a pailful. In the short days of winter, however, and in bad weather, they could not collect five pailfuls in a week. In the wretched locality already referred to as lying between the docks and Rosemary Lane, redolent of filth and pregnant with pestilential diseases, and whither all the outcasts of the metropolitan population seem to be drawn, either in the hope of finding fitting associates and companions in their wretchedness, for there is doubtlessly something attractive and agreeable to them in such companionship, or else for the purpose of hiding themselves and their shifts and struggles for existence from the world in this dismal quarter, and branching from one of the many narrow lanes which interlace it, there is a little court with about half a dozen houses of the very smallest dimensions, consisting of merely two rooms, one over the other. Here in one of the upper rooms, the lower one of the same house being occupied by another family and apparently filled with little ragged children. I discerned, after considerable difficulty, an old woman, a pure finder. When I opened the door, the little light that struggled through the small window, the many broken panes of which were stuffed with old rags, was not sufficient to enable me to perceive who or what was in the room. After a short time, however, I began to make out an old chair standing near the fireplace, and then to discover a poor old woman resembling a bundle of rags and filth stretched on some dirty straw in the corner of the apartment. The place was bare and almost naked. There was nothing in it except a couple of old tin kettles and a basket and some broken crockery ware in the recess of the window. To my astonishment, I found this wretched creature to be, to a certain extent, a superior woman. She could read and write well, spoke correctly, and appeared to have been a person of natural good sense. Though broken up with age, want, and infirmity, so that she was characterized by all that dull and hardened stupidity of manner which I have noticed in the class. She made the following statement. Oh, I'm about sixty years of age. Uh, my father was a milkman, and very well off. Uh, he had a barn, and a great many cows. I was kept at school till I was thirteen or fourteen years of age. About that time my father died. Then I was taken home to help my mother in the business. After a while, things went wrong. Uh, the cows began to die, and Mother, alleging she could not manage the business herself, married again. I soon found out the difference. Glad to get away anywhere out of the house, I married a sailor and was very comfortable with him for some years, as he made short voyages and was often at home, and always left me half his pay. At last he was pressed, went at home with me, and sent away. I forget now where he was sent to, but I never saw him from that day to this. The only thing I know is that some sailors came to me four or five years after, and told me that he deserted from the ship in which he had gone out, and got on board the Neptune, East India man, bound for Bombay, where he acted as Boatswain's mate. Some little time afterwards, he had got intoxicated while the ship was lying in harbour, and going down the side to get into a bum boat and buy more drink, he had fallen overboard and was drowned. I got some money that was due to him from the India house, and after that was all gone, I went into service in the Myland Road. There I stayed for several years till I met my second husband, who was bred to the water too, but as a waterman on the river. We did very well together for a long time, till he lost his health. He became paralysed like, and was deprived of the use of all one side, and nearly lost a sight of one of his eyes. This was not very conspicuous at first, but when we came to get pinched, and to be badly off, then anyone might have seen that there was something in the matter with his eye. Then we parted with everything we had in the world, and, at last, when we had no other means of living left, we were advised to take to gathering pure. At first I couldn't endure the business. I couldn't bear to eat a morsel. 
and I was obliged to discontinue it for a long time. My husband kept at it, though, for he could do that well enough, only he couldn't walk as fast as he ought. He couldn't lift his hands as high as his head, but he managed to work under him, and so put the pure in the basket. When I saw that he, poor fellow, couldn't make enough to keep us both, I took heart and went out again, and used to gather more than he did. That's fifteen years ago now. The times were good then, and we used to do very well. If we only gathered a pailful in the day, we could live very well. But we could do much more than that, for there wasn't near so many at the business then, and the pure was easier to be had. For my part, I can't tell where all the poor creatures have come from. Of late years, the world seems growing worse and worse every day. They have pulled down the price of pure, that's certain, but the poor things must do something. They can't starve while there's anything to be got. Why, no later than six or seven years ago, it was as high as three shillings, six pence, and four shillings, a pail full, and a ready sale for as much of it as you could get. But now you can only get one shilling, and in some places one shilling, two pence, a pail full, and... As I said before, there are so many at it, that there is not much left for a poor old creature like me to find. The men that are strong and smart get the most, of course, and some of them do very well. At least they manage to live. Six years ago, my husband complained that he was ill in the evening and lay down in the bed. We lived in Whitechapel then. He took a fit of coughing and was smothered in his own blood. Oh dear, the poor old soul cried. What troubles have I gone through? I had eight children at one time, and there is not one of them alive now. My daughter lived to thirty years of age, and then she died in childbirth. And since then, I have had nobody in the wide world to care for me. None but myself, all alone as I am. After my husband's death, I couldn't do much, and all my things went away, one by one, until I've nothing but bare walls. And that's the reason why I was vexed at first at your coming in, sir. I was yesterday out all day and went around Oldgate, Whitechapel, St. George's East, Stepney, Bow and Bromley and then came home. After that I went over to Bermondsey and there I got only six pence for my pains. Today I wasn't out at all. I wasn't well. I had a bad headache and I'm so much afraid of the fevers that are all about here though I don't know why I should be afraid of them. I was lying down when you came, to get rid of my pains. There's such a dizziness in my head now, I feel as if it didn't belong to me. No, I've earned no money today. I've had a piece of dried bread that I steeped in water to eat. I haven't eaten anything else today, but pray, sir, don't tell anybody of it. I could never bear the thought of going into the great house. Workhouse. I'm so used to the air that I'd sooner die in the street as many I now have done. I've known several of our people who have sat down in the street with a basket alongside them and died. I knew one not long ago who took ill just as she was stooping down to gather up the pure and fell on her face. She was taken to the London hospital and died at three o'clock in the morning. I'd sooner die like them than be deprived of my liberty and be prevented from going about where I like. No, I'll never go into the workhouse. My master is kind to me. The tanner whom she supplies. When I'm ill, he sometimes gives me a sixpence, but there's one gentleman has done us great harm by forcing so many into the business. He's a poor law guardian, and when any poor person applies for relief, he tells them to go and gather pure, and that he'll buy it off him, for he's in the line. And so the parish, you see, don't have to give anything. And that's one way that so many have come into the trade of late. But the likes of me can do little or no good at it. Almost everyone I've ever known engaged at pure finding were people who were better off once. I knew a man who went by the name of Brown, who picked up pure for years before I went to it. He was a very quiet man. He used to lodge in Blue Anchor Yard and seldom used to speak to anybody. We two used to talk together sometimes, but never much. One morning he was found dead in his bed. It was of a Tuesday morning, and he was buried about twelve o'clock on the Friday following. 
About six o'clock on that afternoon, three or four gentlemen came searching all through this place, looking for a man named Brown and offering a reward to anyone who would find him out. There was a whole crowd about them when I came up. One of the gentlemen said that the man they wanted had lost the first finger of his right hand. Then I knew that it was the man that had been buried only that morning. Would you believe it? Mr. Brown was a real gentleman all the time, and had a large estate of, oh, I don't know how many thousand pounds, just left him. And the lawyers had advertised and searched everywhere for him, but never found him. You may say, till he was dead. We discovered that his name was not Brown. He had only taken that name to hide his real one, which, of course, he did not want anyone to know. I've often thought of him, poor man, and all the misery he might have been spared if the good news had only come a year or two sooner. Many of the very old live on the hard, dirty crusts they pick up out of the roads in the course of their rounds, washing them and steeping them in water before they eat them. Probably that vacuity of mind, which is a distinguishing feature of the class, is the mere atony or emaciation of the mental faculties proceeding from, though often producing in the want of energy, that it necessarily begets the extreme wretchedness of the class. But even their liberty, and a crust, as it frequently literally is, appears preferable to these people to the restrictions of the workhouse. Those however, who have studied the mysterious connection between body and mind, and observed what different creatures they themselves are before and after dinner, can well understand that a long-continued deficiency of food must have the same weakening effect on the muscles of the mind and energy of the thoughts and will as it has on the limbs themselves. Another informant, a pure collector, was originally in the Manchester cotton trade and held a lucrative situation in a large country establishment. His salary one year exceeded £250 and his regular income was £150. This, he says, I lost through drink and neglect. My master was exceedingly kind to me and has even assisted me since I left his employ. He bore with me patiently for many years, but the love of drink was so strong upon me that it was impossible for him to keep me any longer. He has often been drunk, he tells me, for three months together, and he is now so reduced that he is ashamed to be seen. When at his master's, it was his duty to carve and help the other assistants belonging to the establishment, and his hand used to shake so violently that he has been ashamed to lift the gravy spoon. At breakfast, he has frequently waited till all the young men had left the table before he ventured to taste his tea, and immediately, when he was alone, he has bent his head down to his cup to drink, being utterly incapable of raising it to his lips. He says he is a living example of the degrading influence of drink. All his friends have deserted him. He has suffered enough, he tells me, to make him give it up. He earned the week before I saw him five shillings two pence, and the week before that six shillings. Before leaving me I prevailed upon the man to take the pledge. This is now eighteen months ago, and I have not seen him since.'